For this reason, Siddhartha finally departed again, to seek someone who might have higher knowledge than Ra Kalama, and who would be able to teach him more. Later, Siddhartha found that an old sage named Udaka Ramaputta had profound learning and highly virtuous character. So he approached Udaka Ramaputta, became his pupil, and studied and practiced devotedly until his knowledge and capability were equal to his master's. Udaka Ramaputta also became very fond of Siddhartha, admiring his intelligence and talent, and urged him to stay and help him teach his disciples. But Siddhartha was not completely satisfied with Udaka Ramaputta's teaching. What he taught was, indeed, higher than Rakalama's teaching had been. Practicing with Udaka Ramaputta Siddhartha learned how to make his mind very still and empty of all thoughts and emotions, and then remain in even a deeper samadhi than before. Even so, he still could not clearly understand the ever-present problem of life and death. Therefore, Siddhartha left Udaka Ramaputta's place also, and now decided to stop visiting and learning here and there, but to search for the ultimate truth by means of his own wisdom and effort instead. In that era, just as in modern times, there were many monks of various cults in India, who renounced their families to practice asceticism. They believed that, by starving themselves or tormenting their physical bodies, they could be reborn in the heavenly states amid eternal pleasure, and that the more they suffered during the present life, the more pleasure they would be rewarded with in the future. So they practiced hardship by indulging in all kinds of tough and strenuous acts. Some of them gradually reduced their daily food intake until they were eating almost nothing at all and became extremely thin some stood silently on one foot. Some raised one of their hands, pointing to the sky until poor blood circulation finally dried and crippled their arms. Some clasped both hands tightly together and never loosened them, so that the fingernails completely penetrated the palms and grew through to the back of the hands. Some of them slept on boards pierced and fully covered with sharp nails. Siddhartha did try, in various ways, to become an ascetic. He thought that if he increased his hardship to a certain degree, he would surely become enlightened. At that time there were also five other persons, Koa, Badia, Thapa, Mahanama and Asaji who had become monks and followed Siddhartha to Yeruvala. They believed that Siddhartha would finally attain enlightenment by practicing asceticism with such complete devotion and that when he became enlightened he would naturally teach them, as his disciples, what he had attained. Siddhartha practiced a wide variety of special forms of asceticism and then began to reduce his diet until finally he arrived at the point where he was eating nothing at all. He became so thin that his whole bony frame was clearly visible, yet this hard practice did not discourage him one bit. One day, while he was meditating alone, he fainted because of exhaustion. At that time a shepherd boy just happened to pass by. He immediately realized that Siddhartha was about to die because he had fasted too much, for the people of that place all knew that this holy man had eaten nothing for many days. So he ran back to his flock, pulled out a mother goat and returned to the place where Siddhartha had fainted. Then he helped Siddhartha recover consciousness by feeding him goat's milk. Now Siddhartha felt better and began to think, how did I faint and revive, why am I better now? Finally, he concluded that without the goat's milk from the shepherd boy he would have died before ever attaining enlightenment. The shepherd boy received Siddhartha's blessing and returned to his flock with great joy for having the opportunity to help to revive the holy man he so revered. Siddhartha continued to sit and meditate under the tree, and at dusk he heard a group of girls singing on their way to the city, with strings too loose, the lute does not sound. Tighten the strings too much, they will break apart. Not too loose, not too tight, the lute sounds nice. Siddhartha was deeply moved by the girl's song he had tightened his strings of life too much. Should he die before attaining enlightenment, all the hardships he had gone through would be fruitless. Tormenting one's physical body was certainly not the right way to seek the ultimate truth. So he decided to stop practicing asceticism and only to continue his mental diligence in his search for ultimate enlightenment. From that time on, Siddhartha regularly went for alms and ate every morning. Now Siddhartha's health was completely restored, and his complexion became as glowing as gold, the same it was when he lived in the royal palace before.
Although Siddhartha was quite clear now that attempting enlightenment by practicing strict asceticism was just as impossible as twisting sand to make a rope, the five monks who had followed him felt quite otherwise. They still firmly believed that practicing strict asceticism was the only way to enlightenment. When Siddhartha gave up asceticism and returned to normal eating habits, they thought he had become a glutton, so they left him alone and went to Isipatana, now Sarnath, near Vras. One morning a girl named Sujata, who lived in the village, cooked a pot of delicious rice porridge milk and brought it over as an offering to Siddhartha. After presenting the offering, the noble girl said, I wish you success in your aspiration as I have succeeded in my aspiration. Asterisk Siddhartha ate the porridge she offered him and felt it was very beneficial in improving both his physical and mental strength. That same day, Siddhartha went for a bath in the Narendra River. Then he sat down under a solid tree by the riverbank and meditated, hoping to attain enlightenment in the silence of the night when no one might be passing by. At dusk Siddhartha left the solid tree and walked to a large Bodhi tree, which he had chosen previously as the place for his meditation. On the way he met a straw peddler named Satya and accepted from him an offering of a bunch of straw. So he made a seat with the straw and sat down under the large Bodhi tree, facing east. In short, Siddhartha sat under the Bodhi tree and vowed that he would not quit the spot until he had attained enlightenment. Siddhartha let go of all outside disturbances and memories of pleasures from the past. He let go of all worldly thoughts and devoted his whole mind to search for the ultimate truth about life. He asked himself, what is the origin of suffering? How can one be free from suffering? Since Siddhartha was still a young man, only 35 years old, images of the pleasures provided for him by his father when he lived in the palace still appeared in his mind from time to time. To calm his mind, Siddhartha turned his attention to his breathing. At first many distracting thoughts and images appeared in his mind. But Siddhartha resisted all those temptations and gradually entered into first, second, third and fourth jhana. Finally, his mind became very calm, like a pond of still water he was in a deep samadhi. In the calm of Samadhi, Siddhartha searched mentally, trying to find the origin of his own life thus he acquired the power to remember his previous lives. He remembered first one life, then two, then three, then up to many thousands of his lifetimes. Having so ended ignorance about his past, he then directed his purified mind to see the rebirth process of beings in different worlds. Thus he also acquired the divine vision, clairvoyance, the power to see the disappearing and reappearing of beings. He saw that all beings pass from one life to another according to their comma, thoughts, speech and bodily actions. Those beings who have done bad deeds had been reborn into sorrowful states of existence, and those who have done good deeds had been reborn into happy states, all according to their comma. Having so ended ignorance about the future, he directed his purified mind to fully realize the Four Noble Truths, the universal suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to this end. He then saw as it really is, the suffering, the cycle of rebirth. The cause of it, the craving, selfish desire, and ignorance. The end of it, the ending of the craving, Nibbana. And the way to that end, the middle path between the two extremes of self-indulgence and self-injury, the noble eightfold path seeing that, his mind was liberated from all suffering. He then realized that his rebirth was finished, he had lived the noble life and had done what was to be done, so there was no more of that for him in the future this was the third insight knowledge that he gained. So, at the age of 35, Siddhartha Gautama became Buddha, the Supreme Enlightened One. Having attained the supreme enlightenment and freed himself from all worldly suffering, the Buddha remained contentedly in the happiness of Nibbana. That is, the happiness arising from both cessation of all craving and liberation from all suffering. A week later he emerged from the meditation and reflected on the dependent arising, on how the life process arises, continues and ceases. Later a Brahma approached him under the banyan tree, saluted him courteously and asked, Gautama. To be a true Brahma and a noble person, what kind of a moral character must one have? The Buddha paid no attention to the rudeness of being called by name instead of by his title Buddha or Bhagavan, but answered him directly, a true Brahma must abandon all evil, give up all conceit, 
pursue extensive learning and practice pure living. He must differ from ordinary people in his conduct to deserve to be called a Brahma. The Brahma murmured to himself as he left, This ascetic Gautama really sees through my mind This ascetic Gautama really sees through my mind. Many days later, while the Buddha was resting under a pipala tree, two merchants passed by. They found the Buddha sitting extraordinarily calmly and happily like somebody who had won the biggest battle, pleased with his victory. So they reverently offered the Buddha the delicious food they had brought with them. And being deeply impressed by the Buddha's appearance and speech, they requested that the Buddha accept them as disciples. The names of the two merchants were Tapasa and Balika. Because both of them took refuge in the Buddha, they became the Buddha's first two disciples. After a long rest, the Buddha began to plan what he should do for the future. At first he thought, the Dhamma I have comprehended is difficult and profound, and it can hardly be accepted by most people, whose desire for sense pleasures is very strong. Some people have few delusions, some people have keen intellect and fairly little craving. Such people may be able to accept this Dhamma. They are like the lotuses that extend their stalks from the bottom of the pond up in the air, to receive sunshine so I should not hold this radiant truth a secret. I should make it known everywhere, so that all people can benefit from it thus he decided to propagate the Dhamma. After making up his mind, the Buddha began to ponder, whom shall I teach first? This person must be inclined to the teaching of Dhamma and must be quick in understanding it. First the thought of his own master Rakalama, who was a wise man of reason and had very light desires. He was definitely the person to accept the Dhamma. But he soon found that Rakalama had passed away. He then thought of his other master, Adaka Ramapada, but soon found out that he also had died. Finally, he remembered the five monks who had followed him before in the practice of asceticism at Yeruvala. When he found that they were living at Isipatana, modern Sarnath, near Vras, he soon left to find them. At Isipatana, when the five ascetics saw the Buddha approaching in the distance, they talked among themselves, look their monk Gautama is coming straight over. He has abandoned asceticism and became a greedy person. When he arrives, let's not talk to him nor even greet him, nor take his robe or bowl let's only prepare a seat for him let him sit down if he likes otherwise let him stand. Who would bother to greet a man of shaky will like him? But when the five monks looked at the Buddha as he approached nearer to them, they found that he was not the sort of person they had thought him to be. They noticed that he was surrounded by a brilliant light, halo, and looked very noble they had never seen such a one before. They were so astonished that they unconsciously forgot what they had just been saying. One went to meet him and take the robe and bowl from the Buddha's hands others prepared a seat and offered him some water. After sitting down on the seat they had prepared, the Buddha told them, Monks, I have realized the truth of the end of suffering, Nibbana. If you learn about it and practice the way to it according to my direction, you will soon be enlightened. Not in the future life, but in the present life. I tell you nothing but the truth, that you must transcend birth and death by yourselves. On hearing the Buddha's words, the five monks could not help doubting him because they had seen him devotedly practicing asceticism in pursuit of the ultimate truth, but then he failed. Now he came and said he had already attained the unborn and undying Nibbana. So the five monks were reluctant to believe what the Buddha was saying, and they asked him many questions at last the Buddha said, Monks please think. Did I ever tell you all these things before when we stayed together? Did I ever try to convince you that I had found the supreme truth? The five monks admitted that, Indeed, the Buddha had never said such things before, so they no longer refused to listen to the Buddha's teachings. So on the full moon day of July 589 BC, the Buddha gave his first teaching, discourse, to the five monks at Isipatana. This event was later recorded as the first discourse, setting in motion the wheel of truth. During this first talk, the Buddha explained the four noble truths to the monks. Koa understood everything, and all of his doubts about the Dhamma were cleared, and he attained the first stage of enlightenment. Because of this he requested that the Buddha accepts him as a disciple. Thus Koa became the first Buddhist monk, Bhikkhu. From that time on, the Buddha stayed with the five monks at Isipatana and taught them what he had realized. 
All the five bhikkhus practiced diligently, and with the help of the Buddha, they soon became fully enlightened arahants in the world. The Buddha taught next the Anatalakana Sutta, that is the discourse on the characteristic of no self, 